Thank you all for getting out of bed at a very reasonable hour on a Sunday to make it down for the last in the series of the ephemera dialogue discussions um, that have been organised by Swire Property. So uh, there's a few familiar faces in the audience today, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Susie Anetta, and I'm the founding editor-in-chief of Design Anthology magazine. Um, today we're going to be talking about design in the 21st century, do we need a digital detox? And the premise is, with increasing access to new technologies and software, are designers losing their sense of craft and the knowledge of how to actually make things? So to talk to you today about that, we have an esteemed panel of speakers for you. My immediate left is Joyce Wang, Hong Kong-based interior designer, the founder and creative director of Joyce Wang Studio, multi-award winning practice. Next to Joyce is Brie Phillips. She is the international representative of Maharam Textiles, uh, a US-based textile company that has a very long history of collaborating with artists and designers. Uh, next to Brie is Dr. Eric Schuldenfrey, an architect, designer, and co-founder of the Hong Kong-based multidisciplinary practice, SQ. And they're responsible for this very elegant stand that we're sitting on today. Then we have Janice Provisor and Brad Davis, and they are individually acclaimed artists, but together they are the creative force behind the luxury rug company, Fort Street Studio. And last but not least, we have Tanya Willis, who is an illustrator, cartographer, graphic artist, and design educator. Um, before we get started, can I please remind you all to put your phones on silent? Or maybe we should be turning them off for a real digital detox. <laughs> okay, we're going to start. I have a quote uh, by Hella Jongurius, the Dutch designer who spoke at the Design in Darba conference last or a few weeks ago in Cape Town. And her work is known for uh, the marriage of craft and industry. And she said, perfection kills everything. Good design, good art, sorry, triggers the imagination over and over again. That's a feature that we have lost in design. So I kind of get the feeling that Jongurius is suggesting that we're missing something because technology has a huge part to play in design and that produces design that is perfect and not so humanistic. Um, Joyce, maybe starting with you because you're right next to me, can you perhaps comment on what you think of that quote? Um, I think for specifically to, to what I do in interior design, um, technology, am I speaking too close to me? I'm not sure. Um, technology for me is part, part of a, the process as opposed to um, something that generates a final product. Um, so for example, at Mot 32, um, a restaurant that you might be um, familiar with, um, there's a room that has um, a pattern of brickwork within it, which wouldn't have been possible had technology not been accessible. Um, and it also wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have a diagram generated to prove to the con contractors that um, this intricate pattern was possible. Um, but saying that, we used that diagram, we took it onto site and we followed it using our hands and um, brick and mortar um, and we followed that diagram to show the contractors that it can be done by hand um, as as per following this kind of um, recipe list. Um, so the final product was very much a um, handcrafted piece of work, but the process, I would say, wouldn't have been possible um, from technology. So um, for us, um, I think technology has its place in, in processes, but not necessarily the product itself. Yeah. Bree? Yeah. Um, I come from the uh, textile point of view with this, and uh, technology is really essential to what we do. Um, so I think that as far as um, how Maharam has approached this, is it's, it's sort of caused a shift for us in how we approach technology. Um, that's actually allowed us to explore a lot of new avenues um, when it comes to synthetics and those sorts of things, um, synthetic products to work with. We have a lot of very avant-garde products coming out of places like Japan, um, which have access to technology we just haven't had up to this point. So it's, it's, it's a type of craft into, unto itself. Um, so different from the days of, of looming things by hand, um, but it, it allows kind of a new opening in the, in the marketplace. 
uh, for those types of products. And just to kind of address Hella Yongaria specifically, Meharam's done collaborations with Hella for, um, I believe since 2002. So we've had a really long established relationship with her. And I think she's, she's really kept um, craft as part of what we do. And a large part of how she's approached it in her work with Meharam is looking f to apply industrial processes, um, but keeping a natural or a crafted element to it. So, uh, for example, this is something she didn't do for Meharam, but she has a set of um, dishes that she's designed. She's a product designer. Uh, for those of you that are not as familiar with her work. And she calls it a B set of dishes. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, a joke because it's a very high-end um, project. Uh, the, the, the actual um, vessels are formed as part of an industrial process. They fire them at a very high temperature. And what it causes it to do is actually warp each dish. And each one becomes very unique and has a handcrafted element to it. So there's ways of building that into industrial process, into an industrial process. Um, but it's just sort of approaching it from a, a different angle, I think. So. There's a real irony with our work uh, as well. Before, uh, there used to be this idea that an architect always sketches. And the sketch then becomes the building. And you use technology to have the building um, in some ways embody the sketch. In our practice, we've been doing something that's actually quite backwards, I'd say, uh, almost the opposite, where we use technology to help develop the ideas. And then as we get closer to having the ideas realized, we rely more and more on the handcraft. Uh, even this as an installation, when we first started to develop it, we developed it as this concept of a few points in space. And then everything and all the geometry was just derived by a few points in space. And then it was essentially written in software. So we didn't draw a single line of any of this. So everything was just determined as we wrote the software and made decisions through the software. Then slowly, as we began to build it, something interesting happened. We were at the factory in China. And we had to translate. And we had these very elaborate drawings to translate everything from the digital into a very, um, it could all have been computer controlled in order to be built. But the factory in China was more familiar with building with their hands. And so we had to then translate our very precise drawings into a way of working in order to build it. And as a result, we built a machine. Uh, the factory built a machine by hand that would then twist things in space. And so there was a point in space that they actually built something and started to twist around it. So everything was then done as a process by the hand. And then it really reinterpreted it. And this goes to the even the nth degree, where in, under the floor, if you look, there's lines that, that move through the pavilion or through the, the installation. And those were actually all drawn with a pencil. And so it's absolutely ironic that we use the technology in a way to express the ideas. But then it was the pencil that we needed to build it in the end. And so it's almost reversing the entire process as well. Um, I think that uh, we start from a very different point of view than all of you because uh, when we first started out, uh, we didn't have a computer. We didn't, there was no software, there, uh, we didn't know how to turn on a computer and our son taught us. But when we started these carpets that we do, we felt that they could not be done without some kind of technology, but we wanted to keep the hand in. We started by using just watercolors and then we had to find a way to translate the watercolor into a, a digital pattern or a pattern and to make it come out and still look like it was really hand done. And I, Brad was the one that came up with the, um, it's, not, it's an application of a software and very different than the software that you can buy now. And I think that he can talk about that a little more, but I think the marriage between um, uh, the hand and the digital pattern is very important in our work. And now as um, there have been so many programs written for carpets, for textiles, particularly for carpets, because carpets are hand knotted. What we do, it's, it's labor intensive, one knot at a time, uh, takes many months. Uh, it, when you see a lot of carpets um, now that use all these, the software, Brad can point out and say, that's a Galantia carpet. That's a Ned Graphics carpet. Because the programs can seduce you into thinking that you can do anything. But in fact, when 
the marriage between thinking about what you're going to do and using the program, not having it use you, I think is what we're really interested in. Uh, I think that the first intuition that we had to create this watercolor effect was um, to use a Xerox machine, very low level technology at that time, to break down this watercolor blending into little parts. And of course, the next step was to realize that a knot is a pixel. And so that Photoshop became our real entry into being able to interpret this watercolor effect uh, into a handmade object or carpet that was made knot by knot. At the time, there was no technology or there was no software to do this. So we, it was really uh, a kind of um, hunt and search for the right program, the right way to use it. And it was very hands-on in that sense. And as it went along and our vocabulary caught on, like Janice said, software was developed to do this process. But the process, like Hella Youngirius mentions, became stiff and standardized and regular. So like Janice said, I can tell a carpet that's used Net Graphics or use Galantia, which are the two main programs that are used, because it fixes this idea without any uh, of the variation that makes things really interesting. Um, I thought coming over here uh, of a quote um, of a favorite musician of mine, a Thelonious Monk, when he was asked about all the young a jazz pianist, and he said, where are the mistakes? And that's kind of where we are. We need to leave the mistakes in that lead us to new intuitions, new approaches, the accidents that creativity really um, is founded on that leads you off in some unexpected direction. And that's the problem with technology. It's a great tool, but it also is a kind of a prison because it needs to be regular to function as technology. And creativity needs that kind of chance, accident, uh, surprise in order to really move forward. And so technology has to follow, I think, um, the, the advances in technology and just regard it as a tool and not the end all. Thank you. Um, I would totally agree with what Brad's just said, actually. He covered much of what I was thinking. For Illustration, I think there's a trend moving back towards uh, the handmade because we've had a decade, more than a decade of vector illustration, which is effectively illustrators knowing where they're going and just going through the motions of uh, the software to take them there. There are very few happy accidents on the way, which is what creativity should be and is. And I think that for a lot of illustrators, we are now using software as a kind of tool to help us, but the most important thing is our vision. And if we make some of our vision through hand tools and then we use um, software as a kind of extra tool to help, then that's the way to move forward with illustration. I mean, my students have already coined a, um, a phrase called tradigital, which I'd not heard until the other day. It's quite a weird portmanteau. But I think that's the way a lot of illustrators work now. So they're still drawing, but they will scan and composite through Photoshop. Because ultimately, we really need to keep the mistakes in our work because that's true creat creativity. Great. So it, it seems to me that there is a little bit of a disconnect, perhaps, between craft and industry. And I'm wondering if that disconnect is somehow related to education and how design is taught at school. So Joyce, my question for you is you studied both architecture and materials and sciences, or material science. Uh, and you mentioned before the example at Mot32, and I think when I first met you, Ammo had opened, and the staircase light fixtures at, um, at, at Ammo are, are a really good example, I think, of your work and how hands-on you are with your contractors and the fabricators. And I'm wondering whether you think the education that you had you know, has a big part of your working process. I think the... Um I was educated in the US for undergraduate and then um, under the British system for graduate school at the Royal College of Art. Um, and I think the, the marriage of the two really gave me a unique perspective as to how I approach design um, and how I persist with an idea. Um, I think with MIT, um, it'd be interesting to, to hear what Eric has to say about it as well, because 
similarly American education. Um, I think technology is very strong, you know, and we're very well equipped with software skills um, in terms of how to do things. And I think um, with the RCA, um, the Royal College in, in London, it was really um, more about the strength of an idea um, as, as opposed to really how you execute it. Um, and so it goes back to what Brad and Tanya were saying about having the vision. Um, and not allowing technology to, to drive that vision or have you be lost um, because you get carried away with what technology can and cannot do. Um, so I think with, with the case for Ammo, um, the, the staircases were very much inspired by, by something quite intangible from a film, from Alphaville, um, and the reoccurring scenes of that staircase within it. Um, we didn't know how to rationalize in the beginning. All I knew that was I wanted to draw people's focus to this beautiful high ceiling through this amazing architectural device and to really rationalize how to build it. You know, we turned to technology. You know, we built various models out of different software. You know, we played around with 3D Max, with SketchUp, with um, Rhino. And um, at the end of the day, it was really making that prototype um, using physical material, knowing what, what exact joints there are that um, made it successful, I think. Cool. So, Bree, you mentioned before about the fact that Maharam is a company that's, um, I guess, perhaps quite unique in the fact that they work with artists like Fadi Youngstra, Heli Ongurius, but also <laughs> produce very high-tech, high-performance textiles. And I'm wondering how you go about actually educating your staff um, and your clients and end users about the variety of different textiles that you will produce. We have a very focused philosophy at Mahara, and I think that that's the foundation for educating our clients and then also internally um, to our, our sales force and how to represent that product. Um, we have several different uh, areas that we need to focus on because we try and answer a lot of different problems. And some of them are, are design issues and, and some are much more pragmatic. Um, so we look to a lot of different inspirations for work. And we, at Meharam, we actually have an, in, an internal design studio based in, in New York. And that's where, that's sort of the genesis of everything we do. Um, but beyond that, we actually partner with uh, artists and designers outside the textile industry. So we're always looking externally for inspiration. And I think that that's very aligned with um, our philosophy. So the reason that we, we go outside to look for things is to keep things fresh and also to um, question how we do things so that we don't get stuck in technology or in a particular point of view. The rule that we have when we work with collaborators outside of Maharam is that uh, we don't work with anyone with a textile background, <laughs> and we don't work with anyone that has an interiors or architectural background, because they're going to bring a lot of the same vocabulary to that discussion. We've worked with um, decorative artists, we've worked with fashion designers, and each time they come to us, they come with ideas that don't necessarily translate well into what we do. <laughs> which is great for us because it really pushes the envelope and has us um, look for ways to take their ideas and take their knowledge and translate that into a textile. And so it keeps us very fresh. And it it's also creates a good story and a nice, um, it gives us an opportunity to educate internally to our sales force and then also externally to designers. And so it becomes more about um, just a textile project or just about Meharam, but more about design as a whole. And, uh, and I, I would say that that's really, as far as education goes for us, that's sort of the baseline and where we come from with that. So. It's, it's amazing what you can do when you start to cross-pollinate ideas. I love the idea that you always take people from the outside and that you really have to break them from their expectations and break yourself from your expectations as well. And coming back to the point that was made earlier that you can see which programs make which carpets. Uh, the same is very true in architecture. I can look at any piece of architecture and know at least which program was used because there's a very inherent thought and philosophy by the person who wrote and scripted the program. Um, but there's also something else that's beginning to happen. And especially, I always teach technology. Uh, I've taught it at Princeton and Columbia, and also in London. 
And something strange happens when you teach technology. Uh, one of two things. Uh, the first thing that happens is that uh, the, the almost you're trying to follow and understand the program. So you're trying to understand how it thinks and how you can assist your idea. The second thing that happens, and this takes years, but it does happen, um, is that it becomes second nature. It becomes just another tool like a pencil. And it allows you to do things that you couldn't have done with just a pencil. And I think when we think about technology taking over our own brains, we're thinking about the first case every time. We're always thinking that technology and the person who wrote the program is actually the designer. The person who wrote the software is the designer, and we're just following their whims and wishes. But then slowly, over time, as you get to know the software, especially if you start to write it yourself, then you become in control, and you're actually the one who is able then to have your idea be instilled into the software. Often that has to do with speed. If you can design something in 10 minutes and you can only do it with the pencil, that's going to be your mechanism that is your idea, your conduit to the idea. But if you can design something else in 10 minutes that's incredibly complex, but is actually your own unique idea and you're working with it, then it's a feedback mechanism. It allows you to understand and to relate to what you're doing and see it in front of your eyes um, as well. The thing with the craft and, and making something with your hand, though, is also there's an immediate feedback mechanism there that you can see a mistake, you can see the physical properties, and I think you have to hold on to both. I mean, as we design, there was something we actually carried with us. I'm sure Swire can attest to this when we were designing this. There was something I carried with me in my pocket every day. I, wouldn't, I couldn't leave home without it. And it was actually a, a part of one of these joints um, because we had to understand the physics of the piece of wood and not just the, what we had drawn, but actually that material. And I, I should have brought it today, but I, I actually ha I still have it. It's, it's something that we couldn't live without. And I think it was is combining those two things, as a physical piece of wood that we had to carry with us, and also the, the knowledge of, of how we can really control what we want to say with the software. I think um, what Eric said makes a very good point, because while I said that the hand was very important, in no way could our work have been done just by a sketch or a simple pencil drawing. I mean, we may start with, most times, a, a watercolor or some idea, or Brad and I talk about it, but he's become so familiar with the software and how to use it that it's sort of part of an extension of his body, and I can, and I sit with him and we can say, okay, well, what about this and that kind of thing, and do something so quickly. What I find is, uh, while we don't have other people design our carpets, although many artists and designers have asked to, uh, we keep it in-house for the most part, and mostly it's all Brad and myself. But what we notice is that uh, maybe because we come out of the art world, not the, not the design world, um, we didn't study design, we never made a product before we did this, that our inspiration comes from everything we see. There are certain people that design rugs that look at rugs. That's how they design. They look at other textiles. We, of course, look at everything. We're not you know, living in a vacuum. But we look at something that's scratched on the wall at the factory. Uh, we, we go to a marble place in um, uh, India, and we look at a tiny little grain of something. And so I'm sort of surprised when people are designing that they design in such a narrow way because I think it's a big world out there and I get in, we get inspiration from an idea, like you said, from movies, from film. We say, whoa, that, that kind of feeling is what we're driving for. Um, so it's that marriage. Brad, actually, if I can interrupt just quickly. I, I sure. wanted to ask you a question particularly about the production because you're quite hands-on with some of the people right. that you work with in China and Nepal and I'm wondering, what you're saying I was going to address happening. that. Okay, good. Well, then I'll let you do that. <laughs> um, like I said before, technology was the real window to accomplish what we did. But the other side of the story is that we have worked in the factory from day one directly with the weavers, directly with the dyers, t having them teach us exactly what they do. So often design is top down. Somebody has a design, they present the design to the manufacturer, the manufacturer talks to the foreman in the shop, and the foreman instructs the weavers, or in our case, or the technicians what to do. 
we went from the top to the bottom and pretended that we were learning how to weave, learning how to dye. In fact, the, the first um, group of carpets we made, I sat and dyed with the dyer the colors because he didn't understand what we were after. And I didn't know how to dye, but I learned from him how to do it. And that was a real essential thing, is that you were talking about it too, is that you understand how these things are made and let the craftspeople teach you. And then you can go back to technology and use it maybe to make a quicker solution or a more economical solution, because let's face it, economy keeps this thing running. You have to be able to make a product that's not only beautiful and um, high aesthetic value, but something that is cost efficient and that you can sell it at a price that works in the market. And that's the challenge. It's, a, it's almost like, I consider it like a war between time and money and aesthetics. And you fight this war all the time. And so it's really essential to, to understand how things are made sort of almost uh, viscerally. And talking about Hella Yungiris' idea is the craft element is really, really important to move things forward, to know how it's made. And sorry, Brad, what about the weavers that you're working with? Are you noticing that it's those skills are being lost? Is there a young generation that's coming up now? Well, that's you know, what, what's going to happen to the longevity that, of... That's a whole discussion for another panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll let Tanya In talk. terms of China, yes. Skills are being lost every minute. And there isn't the regeneration of a new group of people coming in with, with um, these kind of native skills. And it's a tragedy of development. It's happened every country and every place in the world, and it's happening at warp speed in China right now. Tanya, you're teaching currently at SCAD. Yeah. Um, what, what are your experiences in you know, working with young students and the balance of technology and the work that you do? Well, from a craft point of view, I would say that um, we're noticing that all the studios are full of uh, syntax and computers. We have. I don't know whether I should say it, but we don't have any printmaking facilities, which, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was unthinkable to have any, to lack any printmaking facilities in higher education. I mean, it's a core component of fine art and of graphics, but that's not just the case with SCAD. A lot of, a lot of the colleges have cleared out workshops, printmaking workshops, so physical hand skills are being lost, along with uh, life drawing. I mean, we can look at life drawing and imagine it's like playing scales on the piano. Do we still really need to do this kind of thing in this day and age of digital software? But drawing skills are still essential for students and they're just not being taught anymore. So I find that students are desperate to get their hands on kind of analog uh, crafts like screen printing. And I myself as well think, you know, there's only one place in Hong Kong where you can screen print and that's the Hong Kong Open Printmaking Workshops. And it just seems utterly exotic to spend three hours in there doing something that people took for granted um, maybe 15 years ago. Stone litho, offset litho, those things are so hard to do now. So on one hand, students are using digital software to refine drawings that quite often have an underlying base of really quite poor drawing because they've not been taught for so long. And that's why you often see in illustration now a kind of genre of slightly ham-fisted, naive, faux-naive drawing. Um, I think it's in many ways because you can't, you can't go back to fine traditional illustration that used to exist. And it still does in certain parts, like children's book illustration, where you have people with amazing uh, watercolor skills and traditional painting skills. But uh, in this day and age, the delivery of illustration is expected so quickly and revisions are also expected very quickly, that work, working without digital software is almost impossible. The market and, again, the aesthetics and price that you mentioned, it's very hard to produce work quickly for clients without resorting to digital software in some form. So the students, in terms of education, have amazing software skills. But I'm really concerned about what will happen in the next 10 years when people don't have access to drawing and uh, handcraft skills. So it seems that the actual design process is being changed by the technology that we're working with. Um, actually, Joyce, I wanted to ask you your experiences with your clients. Um, it seems in the world of interior design, you know, you mentioned revisions. 
uh, things like 3D rendering, and I think I think clients, particularly in this part of the world, are expecting to see almost final designs in in some sort of computer generated artwork very early on in the process. And I'm wondering if if you feel that sort of limits you and and how you uh, work with your clients in respect to that, how you manage that process. Yeah, I want I wanted to just add one more note in in response to what Brad was saying about the bottom up approach. Maybe it helps answer the next question. Um, and in terms of educating ourselves with, with the bottom up, because not until you understand in our industry how bricks are laid, how tiles are put on, um, how carpets are woven, can you really challenge um, the fabricator um, to do better or to, to do it the way that you want? Um, so from, from that point of view, I think the educating yourself and then using technology as a refinement tool um, is something that I would personally uh, look to strive for. Um, with the rendering and interior design, I've found that I think it can go sort of both ways. You can be, um, I, I suppose it also depends on the client, um, you know, whether they allow rendering to um, imprison the idea, you know, and be stuck to it. Um, you know, for us, it's also a useful tool because, um, you know, once a rendering is approved, um, the drawings, um, all the specifications, material selection can then be derived from that one rendering. Um, there can be pluses, pluses and minuses, but I think it, it really is in the eye of the beholder um, what that rendering is. You know, often we get clients saying, oh, we've adjusted this one thing, you know, can you update it on the rendering? Um, but I think with a little bit of imagination um, and, and kind of having that sense of, you know, creativity comes from mistakes and maybe imperfection, um, goes a long way when it comes to perceiving renderings, and I think if if we can get clients educated on that, um, then you know the renderings are a great way to communicate ideas. So Bree, maybe if I can ask about your experience, because you actually spent some time with Claudia Youngstra, and she's you know, obviously well known for her beautiful felted wools that she produces. Um, I mean, how on earth does a commercial company like Maharam even begin to think about working with someone like that? Um, for those of you who are not uh, really familiar with Claudia Janstra's work, she is a Dutch artisan. Um, she's really resurrected um, felt in a lot of ways. Um, it was it was becoming a lost art, at least hand felting. Um, and she's she's she studied a lot um, of historical factors, how it was sort of um, going away, and then reinvented it and really started to put her own twist on it. Um, felting is traditionally done with wool, of course, and she works with a lot of other fibers as well, um, silks and, and things that traditionally you, you're not able to felt with. So her work's very unique, and it's a completely handmade process. She does not use any technology to the point that she actually raises her own flocks of sheep. Um, they're actually, they're a Dutch um, type of sheep called Drenth Heath. They're very small. They were, uh, I just think this is fascinating, so I have to share the details with you, but they, they have really um, broad feet so they can pack down dirt, and it was actually, in the Netherlands, they did it to, to uh, help w keep water from flooding in. So that, that was the history of the sheep. So, um, so she raises her own flocks. Um, being a shepherd is not um, something that's a really uh, financially viable thing. To do this has really gone away. So she, she, she keeps her own flock. Um, she grows her own um, plants uh, uh, that are indigenous to the area um, to make dye out of. So that her entire process is very organic. It's, it's probably about as close to 100% handcrafting as you can get. And I spent a week with her in Italy a few years ago doing a felting workshop. And I come from a design background myself, so um, there were several architects that were in this workshop with me as well, and we were all very uncomfortable because it was a much more organic process than we were used to, and we were sitting in trees and weaving amongst branches and, and these sorts of things. Um, but she... Um, I'm sorry, the, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent, so do you mind just... Still very interesting. Okay, no, but remind me where I was going. Uh, I can't remember either, but that's okay. Uh, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> what was your question? I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking about technology and maybe how it's changed the way we work. Um, oh. 
Yeah, I'm off on a tangent as I'm well. so <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, how Maharam works with her. Okay. Yeah. So we really look for authenticity in our work, which, of course, hers is, of course, has a, this great story. But a lot of it doesn't directly apply to what the needs are for our products at Maharam because we, we have performance requirements and these sorts of things in a commercial environment. So... Um, we kind of took a different spin with her, and it's one we haven't done with a lot of other collaborators, where we looked for a solution but that would um, fit a niche we haven't really done. So her work cannot be used, of course, on seating, where you're going to have extreme use. But we looked at it more for wall hangings and unique textile applications in that regard. So um, not a category we grow in a very big way, but her work told such a great story and was very aligned with our philosophy um, as a company. So we wanted to pursue a project with her, and that's kind of where it landed. So. Thank you. Eric, um, we had a bit of a conversation yesterday in more detail about how this stand came about and you talked a little bit about using the pencil and technology, but I actually wanted to go back to what you were saying before in terms of um, education, I think, and, and we were talking a little bit about how that's different here to other parts of the world and not so much culturally, but in terms of space and the lack of um, perhaps machinery and tools that students have here as opposed to other parts of the world. and. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a little? Yeah, I've taught globally, and so when you teach in the US or you teach in the UK, you get a different type of student. And in fact, when I was teaching in the UK, I, did, I only had one UK student. The rest were from Peru or from uh, Sweden or from uh, all over the world, actually a few from Hong Kong. And one of the things that you notice immediately that has happened when you move to Hong Kong and you teach here is that the students don't have any access to the chop saw in you, you know, the garage or the shed, you don't like chop down trees, or you don't have your own flock. Actually, I grew up with my own flock of sheep, so it's very familiar territory. We, we also had a llama that didn't do very well. We couldn't communicate well with the llama. The sheep were much nicer. Um, we, we, had a whole, yeah, we had the whole spectrum of all, all of the, the animals that are uh, in, embedded in the year of the yang, which is any hoofed animal that eats grass. Uh, this is the year of the yang um, as well. And so, um, but we, we experienced a lot of what uh, Tom Willis was saying, which is that here there isn't that ability or that, that um, it's not the ability, there's no exposure actually to be able to do things and work with your, your hands as much, unless it's a very small scale. And that has, it's just simply the size of the spaces that you grew up in and how much access to what type of machinery. Of course, that changes radically. In fact, a lot of us uh, started to teach here, and one of the first things that we did is write several grants um, throughout the university system uh, to allow for traditional tools to come back in. The first, one of the first grants we rewrote was for a table saw. I mean, the most basic of all basic machinery that you need in a school of architecture. Um, and that, would to comp that was written to complement the, the, the CNC machine, the, the computer controlled machine. But we had to write the grant for the CNC machine in order to get the table saw. Actually, we wrote the grant for the CNC machine and said, by the way, we need this table saw. But our minds were still with the table saw, I have to be honest. And, and having also grown up uh, with dark rooms and silt screening and, and printing and I spent I think uh, far too many of my earlier years in a dark room um, so something must have happened uh, during that, that point in time but there's this amazing ability when you do do something with your hands to see what those possibilities are later um, and one of the things that always fascinated me is that Photoshop all the tools in Photoshop are actually mirrored by tools that you use in the dark room there's, there's tools that you do with your hand, and that was a hand symbol in the first versions of Photoshop. And that they were actually really mirroring the tools that you actually do do. And I think that's why Photoshop took off the way it did, is because you can actually do the things that you do in the darkroom digitally, and where the tool then aligns better with the thinking. Um, and coming back to the, the point I made earlier too, that when we think, I mean, someone who's really embedded in technology thinks very easily by scripting a few things and having something come in front of our eyes. I do find something else also happens, is that sometimes in these schools, it's exactly what Tanya Willis has also said, is sometimes in these schools, there is a huge leaning towards technology. And so I find this one student that comes into my mind who could draw the most amazing drawings in his sketchbook. And actually there's another one who draws the most amazing drawings in her sketchbook. And she would never pin them up. She would never show them on the wall. She would barely show them with me. She was just sort of flipping through her pages looking for a note and I saw them. And the problem was is that it didn't become something that she could celebrate. It wasn't something that she felt comfortable actually putting on the wall. Because all of us have become so 
far attuned that the only, it's the more finished, refined process of those ideas have really overtaken our thinking. And I think it's actually important to encourage, no matter which way you can think and make things, you have to encourage, that's the method of thinking. That's where you're thinking your brain translates into your action. So if it's through the pencil, the paintbrush, uh, the, the print, uh, or if it's through the computer, it doesn't matter to me. It's just that is a quicker conduit to get your idea through. Janice, we had a conversation a couple of days ago about a particular celebrity client of yours. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how technology, because as you were saying before, you didn't really have, or you weren't working with technology at the beginning, um, but you certainly are now, and whether that's changed the way you work with clients. I mean, you're not really known for doing custom. Your rugs are really your artworks on the floor, but has the technology changed the way you do work with clients? Well, absolutely. Um, and I would say that... Um, I would say that... Um, particularly uh, in the States uh, and UK too, over 70% of our work is custom. Now that doesn't mean custom bespoke designs for people. It means um, customizing what we do uh, in size and redesigning the motif that it works in a certain kind of room. We're very fluid that way, custom color. And there are certain um, certain clients, of course, who think that they are designers, and you run into that problem, and sometimes celebrities who will go unnamed can be more difficult than uh, your regular client. But I would say that, um, to go back to what Joyce said about the renderings, we give a, a client, when we do a custom design, a computer sketch, a rendering of how their rug will look, uh, maybe de redesigning the motif, changing it. Um, we have a team that does that. Uh, we sit down, Brad and I, and work with them. Brad's taught them how to do that. Um, but what happens is sometimes uh, the client gets wedded to the sketch. And what, what the sketch is is truly a sketch, a piece of paper. That's, that's put out by the computer, printed, you look at it on your, on your screen, but in no way is it the materiality of the actual object. Where light changes when you look at something, what it feels like, what a knot looks like, uh, and sometimes a client gets very freaked out by that because they think if they have that sketch, that's it. That's it, and it doesn't allow for the beauty of the actual object, product, to live in your environment because they're thinking, I have a sketch, and does it match the sketch? Uh, so, but yes, we, I think almost actually, Susie, from the beginning, our carpets could not have been done without technology. From, right from the beginning, uh, we created something, even if it was the Xerox machine, that we could give the weavers um, a knot by knot pattern. And um, sometimes it took several months for the weavers to sort of get it. And now, once they get it, they like working with that much more than a simple drawn cartoon. Uh, so the technology is so much a part of what we do, it's hard to separate it. I, I think what Eric said is absolutely true for us. I mean, some designs just get uh, their origin comes from the computer, and we may print it out and then trace it and do something else with it, and then put it back in the computer. So we're not we're not um, ideologues about it has to be this this watercolor to make it a four street studio carpet. It has to be something that works that's pretty interesting, and wherever we find it is important. And I want to say one quick last thing about teaching because um, before I was supporting myself totally on my art, I did a lot of teaching. And one of the last places we taught, Brad and I taught at Chinese University in 1993. Uh, I was the first um, woman in the studio oh, art, to ever teach in studio art here for a term. We were visiting artists, Brad. We were the first Westerners to teach. but. What was so interesting, and I think this has changed a lot in the last 20 years, that the students, we taught the senior 
um, painting students, the most advanced painting students, and they had a very hard time owning their own work. In what Eric said, that they, they felt they needed assignments still. They needed a project. And we said, no, we're not here for that. We're here to work on, with you on your ideas. And your ideas are really important. And when they graduated, we had them all over for a potluck dinner. And we asked them casually, how many of you are going to go on and make art of some kind? At that moment, not a single person raised their hand. And they had no place to work. They felt they couldn't afford a studio. They felt that they would have no support from um, their families. However, they spent four years majoring in art. And we said, that's a total disconnect. Think how you can incorporate that into your lives. And I think that's changed in the last 20 years in Hong Kong. And there are more students that are out there owning their work and wanting to make art and design. So I, I feel optimistic about that. Do you have anything to add to that, Brad? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, yeah, ask, ask me a new question. <laughs> I no, think we've I, covered I just, this. I wanted to get your thoughts on how technology maybe has changed the way you work, if there is anything else that you wanted to. You have a different point of view, I think, from Janice. It's always it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm much more involved in the technical and technological part of what we do. And um, I remember when we first came to Hong Kong, I had dinner with the uh, head of the Hong Kong University Architecture um, Department, and he said, can you teach anybody to draw? And I said, yes, I can teach anybody to draw, but I can't teach anybody to be an artist. Because drawing is a skill that's teachable, and it's a tool that you can pass on to anybody. Even though they think they can't draw, you can teach them. But to be an artist, I think, is another um, almost innate skill. And you have to learn how to encourage it and bring it out. It's not that it's rare. I think it's quite common. But it's, it's hard to generate um, a um, climate where you can have somebody like your student that has innate artistic ability, but to draw it out and make them own it and make them feel comfortable with it. And that's the real skill of teaching, I think. And technology masks that because it's very easy, it's, it's a, a little slick, and you can come up with a pretty reasonable um, facsimile of an idea or a, um, um, a project with a computer, and it masks the basic inability really to be creative. And that's a little bit of the problem with technology, is that you, you can get a pretty sexy result quite quickly, but there's not much there. And um, that's the real challenge for teaching and for, for teachers, is to draw out that innate, deep ability um, in a student. So my final question for Tanya before we uh, throw it out to the audience to ask a few questions actually almost touches a bit on what Brad just said. We had a conversation a few weeks ago about the age of the internet and the sort of Pinterest phenomenon and how everyone's kind of looking at the same things for inspiration and yeah, almost anyone can kind of put something flash together but is it all starting to look a little bit homogenous and you know, how do you, how do you sort of deal with that in your own work and maybe with your students? Oh, there, was, <laughs> there was me preparing a quest, uh, an answer on the basis of students uh, or, or artists trying to find that connect between their initial sketches that Eric was talking about and that kind of um, excessive polish on the final work. But yeah, the, the idea of looking for um, inspiration and, and research, which is something that I work a lot with my students because quite often they will jump from a briefing to a given answer and you know I have said to them you need to extend your visual imagination and your visual vocabulary by researching a the topic that you're dealing with and b the kind of the visualization and the inspiration which goes with that given topic and that seems to be something that students are in a hurry to rush through but in doing so we've discovered that uh, Art students and professionals and non-professionals alike have kind of flocked to Pinterest 
it's become this world where everyone's looking at the same thing. And um, I find a lot of people have discussed recently that there's a finite point at the end of all these things that we look at that we will all have exactly the same taste. It's the same as going on Amazon. And the algorithms are so sophisticated, they will keep showing you things you like based on what you've just bought. So in a visual world online, that's happening. People are saying, and have been recently, um, everyone's been looking at a kind of vintage, mid-century, modern aesthetic, particularly in illustration and in design. And we've almost hollowed that out. I think um, the danger is that visual artists are trend-driven also by the market and by their clients to bring a certain look to things. And so designers are plowing through the available ephemera like a field of locusts, you know, and at the end of it, that's done. We can't look at mid-century modern anymore. We've eaten it to death. It's appeared on um, an IKEA kitchen cabinet. We're done. It's over. So now, what should we move on to next? And there's, there's a great danger that this mass exposure to things is killing a personal aesthetic and a personal identity because we're way too exposed to what's going on in the world. And we need to get back into our cave, a bit like um, uh, Jonathan Franzen did when he wrote Freedom. He went to um, a writing studio every morning and he superglued the ethernet point in his very old MacBook. So he couldn't possibly be tempted to put his ethernet port in there and go online. So he made himself write for 10 hours a day with no distraction and no kind of contamination of this kind of mass global mind. And I think as artists and designers, if ever there was a digital, digital detox required, it's for that, it's for our visual inner world to retreat from this kind of homogenized idea that we have of what's very now and what we should be looking at. It's very hard to ignore those things, but we do need it. I actually have a question for you, Susie. <laughs> sure. The, t the subtitle is Do We Need a Digital Detox? Um, looking at us all, and, and not just the, perhaps the designers and, and, and thinkers here, but, uh, but the greater world of, of design and art, art, do you think we're all intoxicated? Yeah, I do actually, and that was one question that I was hoping to throw out if we had time, but I think it's maybe time to throw it to the audience. But I'm, I'm actually, I'm kind of curious to know whether we're so kind of, um, taken with the idea of craft and th this sort of sense of handmade because of technology or whether it's, you know, which way that actually goes. I'm wondering if we're craving a sense of, you know, humanness in our design because we are so obsessed and... I was actually going to ask everyone to take their, turn their phones off at the beginning of this, but I knew that I would get a look of horror from the entire audience. So, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think there's definitely room for both, but I mean, obviously what we do is a print magazine and I think that there's still a want and a need for something physical that's handmade and, and almost a little bit analogue in a way. We can't take an iPad to the beach, so thank you. All right, well, I think there are a few microphones floating around and I'm happy to give mine. If anyone has some questions, there's a lot of designers in the audience. I'm sure you have good questions for people, so... Uh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Christoph Kroll. I'm a professor of computational design at the Chinese University and I was dying to be here at this talk. I'm very intrigued at what you said. Um, I was dying to be here because I fundamentally disagree with the title. And hearing you talk, you've touched on many points that are the reasons behind an uncomfortable status quo or maybe not a status quo that we have with the digital um, today. There is two points why I fundamentally disagree with the need for a detox and I would advocate for an intox. I'm curious to hear uh, what you have to say about those. The first point is that I'm talking more from an architectural perspective but I'm sure it's also uh, applicable to graphic design and maybe to uh, fabric design as well. More than half of the population globally will be a first generation urbanite very soon. So there is no nostalgic concept of what a traditional family inherited craft is. So the starting point for most of the projects that we're going to be dealing with in the future, we're going to have to deal with people that are not trained in, in the way that people, that the craftsmen were trained maybe in the mid 20th century. So somehow as designers, we're going to have to retool ourselves for that. So my first question is how do you deal with the designing for people that will put your work together that are not part of this tradition, that are not part of the, the concept even, or the cultural tradition, not, not only the actual 
craftsmanship, but also the cultural vision. How do you respond to that? And then secondly, Eric started to touch upon it in one of his comments. Um, with digital design, and I agree in the past 10 years, maybe we've been very much stuck in a vector-based design method. We're trying to look for things that move on. But we haven't touched yet about the emergent possibilities of designing with digital tools, how digital tools also allow you to think in ways that without digital tools you wouldn't be able to think. Similar to how the perspectival discovery in the Renaissance led to a, a, a more than a hundred year long style, the Renaissance, that dominated architecture. We're potentially at a pivotal point where having access to computational power, allowing us to think more systematically, um, which is necessary in a product driven design with a, a design context where market uh, pressure and time pressure requires that efficiency. But having access to these tools and these computational powers also allows for a new type of design that wouldn't be possible with a pencil. So if these tools become as easily accessible to designers as a pencil, if you have a proper intox, if, you read, if they become an extension of your body, what is a different design that is possible? I almost want to just add to that, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Because there's something, I mean, coming again from the world of architecture, uh, when the I-beam was first introduced in architecture, uh, they quickly clad the I-beam with a lot of stone um, or with bricks. And the I-beam, although it structurally allowed for, for, for skyscrapers, they hid the detail. They hid the thinking. They hid the technology. And it wasn't until decades later where they actually put the I-beam back on the building. And the IB might not be the best example. I mean, we have cities that are all very uh, like slick modernism that doesn't have a degree of life to them as well. And if you do that everywhere across the board, of course, you have another set of problems. But that it's this idea that the technology becomes uh, more pure to itself. It's not so reliant on the technology to try to emulate things that have come before, but it's actually using the technology to be able to look forward to a new type of work um, I, I think Christoph's work is, is that type of work. There's often, when I talked about the two different types of students, it's the, the ones who emulate the things that they've already seen, and they use the tools that they have to emulate those things that they've seen before, or they use uh, the tools to then radically change how we all think, every one of us, and allow for things that we could never have theorized ever without those additional tools. The danger is, is that, uh, in the mass media, there is a replication of the ideas that have come before and using these tools to replicate those ideas. We just need to actually break through more barriers. But to break through barriers, you actually need something. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you need knowledge and skill. And you need deep set of knowledge and deep set of skill. And a lot of these tools aren't easy to learn. They're easy superficially to learn and copy what superficially has happened before. But they're not easy to actually manipulate on your own free will and to break free from how the program has been written by a software. And that's really the difference to me between the, the pencil and the software. The software was written by someone else, a teams of people putting effort into making those tools accessible to your brain. A pencil, the person who invented the pencil, had no um, connection with trying to influence you. It's only the outside influences. The software can be incredibly dangerous because it's, written by, it's essentially written by someone else. Any other questions? Uh, Catherine Shaw. Um, it's interesting, all the discussion has been about using the technology within your design world, but um, it sort of reminds me of the original architect drawing with a pencil, Frank Gehry, and when he was in Hong Kong to open the Swai Properties Opus um, building, I asked him about this drawing and making models and everything, and he said that none of his buildings and none of his designs would have been possible without technology. Now, he, can, he could hardly use his Blackberry, and he doesn't like technology, and he draws and he makes models. But his drawings and his designs and his creativity was so complex that contractors couldn't understand it. So up to the point where he started to invest in technology and, um, and really make it work, he always had the problem where contractors would come along and say to the client, if I just straighten out this wall a little bit, I can save you 30%. And the, at that point, the client was going, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so actually, technology is, 
is responsible for someone like Frank Gehry being able to design some of the most creative buildings we've got. So that's just a, a point of a technology really acting as an enabler, um, just in defense of it. Does anyone have anything else to add? Could, could, could I make just a side way? note? I, I won't uh, take up too much time. The, the side note is in Frank Gehry's office, there's also a hidden irony. Uh, they build enormous scale models, and they're the first work, they actually had a digitizer that would digitize the, the scale models. So basically, he built it completely analog out of paper. And then he didn't describe it in the computer. <laughs> he had the computer make the model, in a sense. And then the model became the building. It was just digitized. So there's a really strange relationship with technology, especially in Frank Gehry's work. Could I add just something to your <laughs> comments? I think perhaps, I don't know if you misunderstood or whether we've created a misunderstanding that somehow all of us on this panel are hostile to technology. We are not. My, our carpets would not exist without technology. The advances in almost all fields, illustration, architecture, in the present day are the result of the blending of creativity and technology. And it will continue. And it will probably continue in a way that none of us have ever imagined. Because it's a tool that, that is creative in itself. But I think what we're talking about in this detox business is that it's so seductive and it is controlling and everybody has to be realized have to realize the tyranny of it on one side and free yourself up to create these new avenues for I'm, just as an example Janice and I feel that we can't really create um, in the day-to-day -day situation so we go on design retreats and we go to some beautiful place, whether it's Bali, Indonesia, the Caribbean, whatever, and people say, oh, you're so lucky. We go to their work. And we take our computer and we take our cell phones and we lock it in a safe. And for a week or two weeks, we really get back to some essential state of mind that we can move forward from. And so I think there's a give and take. And that's the detox side of this argument. Um, and, and your point is very interesting about um, the growth of urbanization in the world and that people do not have the square footage, the ability to have a kind of uh, what, what you described as nostalgic and I think all of us feel are somewhat essential, um, connection to the real world of nature and, <clears throat> and um, grass and trees and what not that and not an intensely built human environment. I think that that aspect of um, humanity is become more and more valuable and more precious. And I think it's worth holding on to and worth really uh, trying to um, incorporate into this technological world we live in. And it's kind of like the, the diamond in the jewelry, you know, it, we, we need that too. And so it's a dynamic. Anyway. One final comment from Joyce, and then I think we might have to wrap it up. Sorry. I promise it'll be good. Um, I think um, going back to what Christoph was saying, and <clears throat> um, also Brad and, and um, Eric about the, the table saw, um, technology masking creativity, and also how do we respond to a generation of fabricators who don't recognize handicraft. Um, um, for me, technology is very powerful of a tool. And I think before anybody should be able to um, use it the way that Eric mentioned, um, you know, to take time and to, and to use it just like you, you can a pencil, you have to be able to confront with the physical world um, and push that piece of wood through a bandsaw. Because not until you do that, you, you're not confronted with I've made this beautiful drawing and a beautiful rendering, but as soon as I c carve that line on a piece of wood, it's not what I'd imagined, and it's actually quite um, ugly. I know that's kind of how I felt when I, when, when I was in school and I had to make part of the building I designed at a one-to-one -one scale. Um, so I think until you have that kind of hand-eye understanding of, of what your design means physically, 
um, you still have to talk to the fabricator, whether that fabricator is um, a 3D printing machine, whether it's um, something that we that doesn't exist today. Um, and I'm familiar with your work too, Christoph. I'm, I'm sure there is still a lot of communication um, that exists in a physical world. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for coming so much. Appreciate the questions. And maybe a round of applause for our panelists, please.